With this said, as you kind of refer to that, I mean, uh, there are probably what I would call the uh, bulk uh, risk factors or the key risk factors for HCC being hepatitis C, hepatitis B, mm -hmm. uh, alcoholic cirrhosis, and also non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Tell us a little bit more about why you're that concerned nowadays about non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So I, I think what we're going to see is a shift in the epidemiology of HCC, and I, I think that's what you're getting at. So let's remember, worldwide, chronic hepatitis B is actually the most common risk factor for HCC, and that's really outside the U.S. That's in East Asia and Africa. Um, in the United States currently, chronic hepatitis C is the most common cause for, for HCC, and this accounts from anywhere from 50 to, in some centers, even up to 65 to 70 percent of HCCs that are being seen. And as you know, the, there's new effective agents for hepatitis C, and so we're going to see cures being offered to many of the patients who currently have hepatitis C, and this should hopefully reduce the future burden of HCV-related HCC. Now, unfortunately, as we continue to solve one problem, another one arises. So we have increasing rates of obesity and increasing rates of diabetes. And patients who have underlying metabolic syndrome are at high risk for developing non-alcoholic non steatohepatitis. It's currently estimated that 30% of Americans actually have non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, with approximately 2 to 3% of the population actually having the form that can progress to cirrhosis and, and HCC. So, and when you, talk, when you look at this from a population attributable fraction, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is actually the, one of the most common reasons that we're going to be seeing HCC. So I think that this is really the future of HCC. That's, if anything, quite concerning because what we thought, and hepatitis C, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the treatment, uh, is a problem that will be resolved. And this is definitely great news in medicine, but at the same time, the non-alcoholic non -alcoholic steatohepatitis and the risk of obesity and uh, diabetes are on the rise. As we heard, 30% of the population has some form of NERS. That's quite concerning. Richard, do you attest to that? Are you seeing a shift in your clinic in regard to the patients with the HCC are you seeing? Yeah, I think obviously uh, regionally across the country, we see differences in, in liver cancer uh, etiologies. Certainly, I think in the US, as you commented, hepatitis C dominates. I think probably in places like New York and Los Angeles, there's a little more hepatitis B. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Los Angeles, we have uh, a large demographic from, from Mexico, and there's an increased risk of uh, diabetes, probably in Dallas as well, and, and we are seeing more uh, non-alcoholic steroid hepatitis-related liver cancer. That's great. Uh, so, so uh, with this said, uh, obviously, and I go back to the story of the cirrhosis, uh, and again, just let's imagine that call of that physician calling for an opinion uh, to Richard or to Ricardo. Uh, you might ask, like, or I need to know how the liver is doing. Mm -hmm. So the Charles Pius core has been rather something we kind of carry on, but at the same time, we we'll protest sometimes and say it's not necessarily the uh, uh, appropriate measure. Uh, take us a little bit, Amit, in regard to what's Charles Pius. So Charles Pius is a scoring system that's based on five variables. Mm -hmm. So the presence of ascites, the presence of um, hepatic encephalopathy, bilirubin, albumin, and INR. And so using these five variables, you can get a score that goes anywhere from 5 to 15. And this has been used traditionally as a good marker of the degree of liver dysfunction. Um, and so when you look at treatment algorithms for HCC, the child pew is actually what's traditionally been built into there. Now, um, you know, this has also been protested, as you said, by some people because um, the assessment of ascites and the assessment of hepatic encephalopathy can be quite subjective. And so there have been new scoring systems that have come up in terms of prognostic variables for patients with HCC, such as the LB score, um, which is based more so on albumin and bilirubin, getting rid of the subjective ascites and encephalopathy um, assessments, which can be um, perhaps easier on oncologists. Um, fair enough, fair enough. No, it's totally understandable, and I know we get through that challenge. If anything, uh, the Charles Pew, I may add here, is actually quite intriguing historically because in 1973, what, what was developed initially by uh, Professor Pew back in, uh, in the UK, this study was to look at patients who had esophageal varices and at risk of, uh, or, or rather at risk of bleeding from esophageal varices, none of them had HCC. 
and you just wonder how can we look into prognostics while there's not a single parameter that's related to the cancer itself. And that's why we came up with so many of the different scoring systems. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, the ALBI, the uh, CLIP, which is the Cancer Liver Italian Program, uh, the QP, Chinese University Prognostic Index, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, there's a BCLC as well that's used rather more of a road map in regard to the uh, assessment of patients in a clinical setting. Ricardo, from your thoughts, uh, how, do, how do you assess patients from their cirrhosis component to decide if you're going to be able to intervene with a local therapy or not? What do you use or what are your thoughts on that? So, of course, interventional radiology options are ideal for this patient population because clearly we can deliver uh, therapy with a minimal invasive approach. Mm -hmm. So we can uh, use ablation uh, in place of resection. We can use different forms of transcatheter therapies. So clearly, um, patients with compromised liver function are indeed eligible for local regional interventional therapy, provided that they do not reach a certain level of decompensation. I would say that in clinical practice, still the child put class is a key factor. And uh, the big difference uh, that, that I think has to be clearly made is between patients in child class A or B and patients in child class C. Those who are in class C, uh, child class C, should probably not receive any form of anti-cancer therapy because they are very unlikely to have any benefit from, from the anti-cancer therapy. Of course, this does not apply to liver transplantation. Fair enough. And if anything, I may add here that a lot of the therapies that actually we apply uh, are based on clinical trials that were really based on the child 2 scoring. To, to begin with, the Serafinib study, which is a phase 3 clinical trial, which uh, uh, accrued patients only with child 2 score A, is a good attestation to that. And obviously, practices are going to be influenced one way or the other by those kind of clinical trials that are either reported or are ongoing, which we're going to talk quite a bit about as well. well let's